This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Here with me is my co-host Michael Riedel from the New York Daily News. Sex and Longing is a controversial new Broadway play from Christopher Durang. And here to talk about it is the playwright himself, Christopher Durang. And he is joined by Dana Ivey, who is giving a terrific performance, I must tell you, in the show. You. Chris, Dana, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Chris, can't beat around the bush on a couple of things. Uh, the critics were less than enthusiastic about sex and longing. In fact, uh, some of them were pretty brutal. How are you holding up under the under the barrage of the critical attack? Well, it's hard to it's hard to deal as a playwright with receiving critics' uh, response. So, truthfully, I haven't read them yet. Uh, genuinely, I don't know if you believe me, but I really haven't. <laughs> so, um, but I did ask Andre Bishop, who's the head of the Lincoln Center Theater. Which is producing least, sex and Yes, line. right, uh, at, the, at the court theater, on, uh, uh, to uh, characterize them for me. So I, I definitely know that they're, they're dismissive and, and not good. So I'm, um, I'm trying to figure it out uh, because, um, well, it's just challenging. You know, be, uh, also we're not in the, I think Dana would agree with me, we're not in the place of going out on stage and going, oh, this isn't working. Oh, mm. the audience is sitting there silent. Oh, you know, mostly they're laughing their heads off. Now, I think there are some people who don't like it, and as to why they're all critics, I couldn't <laughs> say. Um, I never thought all critics were Republicans. It must have been something they ate before they went to the So theater. I don't know. I'm, I'm really in that place of digesting it uh, and trying to figure out what I think. That my last full-length play in New York, I had some one-act plays a couple of years ago that were well-received, but my last full-length play was Laughing Wild, and it also universally got bad reviews. Now, uh, people who follow theater and and uh, like it, like that play. I've come to quite like the play, but I certainly went through a period of thinking, well, am I wrong? Uh, you know, so it's just, a, it's, an, it's an odd thing. I will probably read a few of the, the critics uh, later on. I'm just, uh, uh, I'll take them with a lot of water, like <laughs> something toxic. And, uh, <laughs> a little gin might but, help. But I, I also because I, I want to try to figure out what, what I think about the play myself. But, uh, um, but in any case, we're, we're surprised because audiences are really liking it. And I run into, I run into various people. I mean, I've run into some people who said, "Oh, I was sort of worried about seeing your play because I read the reviews, and I don't know what they're talking about." So that's one <laughs> variation. Uh, I've gotten some letters from strangers who either like the play, or sometimes I get letters from strangers saying, "Well, you know, I didn't like everything about your play, but I certainly liked a lot of it," and blah blah blah. Right, so, right. so that's so, uh, you know. Um, it's interesting, though. I mean, I, I don't want to like read all the reviews to you, Chris. Uh -huh. yeah, I'll, I'll save you some time. Give it the bad news, right? But one of the things, though, that is often said about you, and I'll see if you agree with me, is that um, these reviews said, you know, Chris Durang is such a funny play. We think back to Beyond Therapy and all these plays, but it seems to me that none of your plays have always ha have gotten great reviews. Do you think there's a little revision well, going on in the minds of the critics that uh, right. you, they think you were better back then than they thought at the time? Yes, I find that very frustrating. I've been saying to uh, some friends and, and, and others that I feel like I've been by the play, this is a weird metaphor, but I've like invited people to a chicken dinner and all the people who come and review it go, he makes really good steak. Do you remember when he cooked steak a, a week ago? And, and they're just <laughs> refusing to accept what I've given them. And uh, that's a little bit what I, what I feel like. But yes, there's definitely revision going on. I mean, uh, uh, only of, of my plays, only Sister Mary Ignatius got across the board good reviews. The other plays have been uh, very mixed. But wasn't Sister Mary Ignatius the first that was reviewed a big, well, in a big way? No, actually, I, I was remembering there's a play called Titanic, and it's odd because there's all this Titanic <laughs> stuff right. happening this year, but it was a crackpot farce, and actually Sigourney Weaver, who's in Sex and Longing, yeah. was also in Titanic, and uh, it was done off-off-Broadway where it got sort of mixed reviews, but a nice one from Mel Gussell in the New York Times, and then it was moved to off-Broadway where it got Hideous reviews, really hideous. Well, I my, did read my those. My only point is that with Sister Mary Ignatius, people didn't have expectations of what oh. a Christopher Durang play was. It was oh, uh -huh. you were a new entity to them, and then they weren't reflecting back on. 
I think that could Nostalgia, be true. Nostalgia, Christopher yeah. Durang. Right. We remember. I want right. to bring Dana into the conversation. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> we don't want to forget the. This is fascinating. She's just, she's just the she doesn't read her reviews. Well. I know. Now you told me before that you don't read the reviews yeah, either. I and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I cannot do this with Chris, but I can say to you, the reviews for you—they were all terrific. <laughs> well, that's but all. surely you must just get a sense from perhaps your friends in the theater community what what the buzz is. That uh, you know, you kind of got let off, and and the play got dumped on, and some of the other actors did, but you got great reviews. And I'm wondering if that affects your relationship with the people in the cast in any way, or your performances. I way. felt the first couple of days after we opened, because people call up and say, "I know you don't read reviews, but honey, be happy," and things like that. So you know, and people blurt things out before they, you know, and you stop them saying, "Please, I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything specific." Um, Having somebody, having three people just say, oh, you got wonderful reviews, don't worry about it, uh, was enough to make me self-conscious for a couple of performances, even though that's all we talked about. I mean, it wasn't about, they didn't tell me that the play, you know, maybe had not been so well received, they didn't say it, tell me anything about any other actors, just told me that I'd gotten really good reviews. And that's enough to make me self-conscious. And so that's why I don't read them. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have anything specific in my head, I finally wore off. But when it was still fresh, it was like that horrible feeling that you go on stage and you think, now these people have read something and they're going to expect something. Right. How can I possibly <clears throat> fulfill their expectations if it's something that's over the moon or something? So you feel sort of desperate about yeah. fulfilling something that you don't really know about, you know? And then after a while, of course, it wears off and you just start playing the play, of course, the right. way you always did. You settle in and get back to it. Yeah, but a couple of performances, it's just kind of like, oh, what's, you know? And you feel also that the audience is a little different. They're enjoying it. But you feel this, I don't know how to describe it, except uh, another performer would know on the stage that you know that the body of people out there have read something and their responses are just that much different from mm -hmm. the night before when right. nobody had read anything, well, you I know? So they, they come mm -hmm. with an expectation that you, that you have to, you feel this kind of tension to fulfill, whereas before it was just people who were coming and just loving every minute and taking whatever they, they were, were open given. to an experience. Yeah. I guess it makes it difficult if you, if you have some couple of bad reviews, people come in thinking, you know, predisposed not to like the play, thinking, yeah. God, they told us this isn't very good, and you know, why am I sitting here? Right. Do you think you're able to win them over? Oh, absolutely. I've had many people, and as Chris said, I've had a lot of people come and say, you know, gosh, I read about it, but I don't know what they were talking about. I had a great time. I loved this piece. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are coming. I don't think that because whatever was said, I don't think we'll keep genuine theater goers, theater lovers, mm -hmm. from coming to see it. Krista Rang is a well-known playwright. This is a fabulously um, adventurous piece of theater. And I think anybody who loves theater wants to see something like this. And they will be coming, no matter what is said about it, in order to see for themselves. Because after all, a critic is just one man's opinion. And I frequently don't agree with him. So <laughs> a lot of people don't. You know, They want to come and see for themselves. All right, well, Chris, for those who have not seen the play and who maybe didn't read the review, <laughs> tell us what Sex and Longing is about and what are you trying to do in this play that maybe the critics uh, were unable to grasp. Uh, well, uh, let me tell you about it a little bit. Um, it's. It's a comedy, but uh, I suppose it's on the dark side. And it, it tells uh, about two sex addicts, it would be appropriate to call them. Uh, a, a man, Justin Gay, who has sex every three hours or feels driven to, and his flatmate, Lulu, played by Sigourney Weaver, who has to have sex every 15 minutes. And uh, this was a little triggered in my imagination by Vatican's play, Lulu, mm. which theater history majors would know, uh, and where Lulu, toward the end, becomes very compulsive about sexuality. And is killed and by Jack the Ripper. I yes, think. and Jack the Ripper also shows up in my play. So yes. for theater history majors, it's a bonanza. This, is a, this play's <laughs> got to be popular with dramaturgs at oh, Yale, yeah. I can tell you. But that, anyway, that's theme one, uh, and that's the longing part, because it's not meant just to be flip, but you know, I, I think that uh, a lot of addictions come from trying to assuage psychological pain, and I think that's true of sexual addiction. I try to write that in with Lulu and Justin, especially Lulu, who has many memories she keeps repressing that mm. we deal with in the play later. But then there's a, a, a parallel theme, which is where Dana's character comes in, which is the religious right. And it's, uh, there's a, uh, Dana plays a conservative Catholic senator's wife, and Guy Boyd plays her, her uh, senator husband. And they Se sleep in separate beds. 
uh, chair like <laughs> yes separate beds <laughs> but the same yeah. same uh, bedroom uh, but they eventually the, this minister uh, and uh, Dana's character combine forces to uh, initially to uh, uh, try to ban or or bring up to public ridicule this uh, sexually explicit book, explicit book that Justin and Lulu wrote, which is called Explicit Photographs of the Last 300 People We Slept With. <laughs> and it's meant to uh, uh, refer to all the Robert Maplethorpe hoopla that happened in the National Endowment for the Arts, mm. where his photographs, some of them are indeed shocking, mm. although I'm fine about funding them, but then that's me. <laughs> um, and so those two themes go on, and, and um, it is a three-act play. and. Uh, uh, in the, somewhere in the middle, Lulu uh, uh, finds religion and kind of for a while joins the, min the minister and uh, mm -hmm. the senator's wife. And there's a scene I'm actually very proud of in writing and that uh, Dana and Sigourney and Peter Michael Getz get to be, I think, quite brilliant in, which is in the middle section of the play where Lulu is retaught how to have conversation in society. It's like a Pygmalion kind it's, of a... Yes, it, yes, it is. And uh, that's, uh, that's a very... Uh, well, fr I'm frankly proud of it, and I, th I think part of uh, Dana's acclaim comes from how good she gets to be in that scene, uh, the other actors, too. Uh, yeah. Now, um, and then I won't tell you the ending, because <laughs> you'll just have to come no, and the see. No, and, 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 and the surprise character. Oh, and there is a surprise character. Wonderful character. surprise <laughs> character. Dana, we, did you look at Elizabeth Dole to shape your character? Oh, that's an unfair uh, <laughs> jab at Elizabeth Dole. I, I think she's, I, I think I'd think rather like Elizabeth Dole. <laughs> no, I mean... Uh, Quite frankly, I looked at Elizabeth Dole simply just the look of her. I like yes, the, the way look. she looks. Her suits and her hair, I thought, was a great look. So s vaguely patterned after her look. Nothing to do with her character. Her look. Her look. The, the, uh, the, the, the Christian right figures are they're kind of the villains and, and uh -huh. the heavies here. Uh, but, you know, you've got to play these characters. You, do you, are you an actor who tries to find some sort of sympathetic angle in the character? Do you see this woman as uh, some sort of... A monster, a figure of ridicule oh, for us to laugh not. at and dismiss as being some kooky right wing I fanatic. Think she's a person of deep sympathy, and no, I. Um, <laughs> I agree with you, though. I mean, I think she's a person. No, who I have absolutely no problem. I don't know. There must be something wrong with me. I completely <laughs> understand her. Um, you know, I am not her You're at all. I don't believe in anything she believes in, and yet I understand how she does and can, and therefore right. I can when I'm her. Yeah. And so. Um, and some of what she says isn't that far off, and some of it is. But then if you believe part of it, you have to believe the rest of it, you right. know. So um, I don't, uh, I but didn't have a trouble grasping what she wants or how she wants to get it at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. There's an important line that her character has, which I felt was important when I was writing it, and I think the way Dana plays it, uh, she th feels it too, which is that I, uh, Bridget McRae, her character, longs for morality. So I, I was looking for all the different characters to have their own longings. and. Lulu's character is longing for uh, comfort, I guess, and is looking to sex for it. But uh, Bridget is looking for morality and for the order she felt in the things she believed when she was a child mm -hmm. and one of the side issues. Originally, I wasn't going to make her Catholic because I thought that was a cliche because I write, have written so much about Catholicism. Right. And then I went back to, well, <laughs> write about what you know. Right. <laughs> so the minister is not Catholic, obviously, but um, uh, uh, Bridget as the... Uh, and the minister sometimes bicker because her fantasy is that the Blessed Mother is going to come back to earth and make everything right. right. And he keeps wanting the thought of Jesus to come back. And they sort of have tension about it, which <laughs> Our amuses me. Are slightly sort different. Of. I, I must say, I find the character very, very sympathetic only because I am kind of a right-wing nut and, and a Republican. <laughs> but I like her because uh, she, is, she is like Lulu in the sense that she's not a hypocrite in any way. I mean, she mm. believes, absolutely believes in her point of view, which is a legitimate point of view to Oh, hold. no doubt. She's yeah. not like the, the priest no who wants to sleep right, with Lulu right. or mm -hmm. her husband, who's mm -hmm. the uh, two-faced politician. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in that sense, I think, you know, she is a well-drawn character and not mm -hmm. just a kind of straw man to stick mm -hmm. up to make fun mm -hmm. of the Christian Oh, absolutely mm -hmm. not. No, I, I, I love writing, uh, I loved writing Bridget. And um, uh, also, Bridget is incredibly verbal. And I think it's part of uh, Dana's gift that she's so good with words uh, because, uh, anyway, I, I, I think we used to giggle in rehearsal because Bridget's thought processes, sometimes she'd be asked a question, I mean, the character would be asked a question and the answer would be, the, the Reverend would say, what, what, what is your, when can I meet your husband? She says, oh yes, my husband, well he's a very good man, but, and then she'd go off on this side issue and then go off on another one. And it was like <laughs> this intricate mess exactly, of yeah. logic. And, yeah. uh, Anyway, I think Chris Dana apparently does that knows great. a lot of people who 
talk that way, <laughs> or think that way, because he writes them so well. <laughs> uh, now, when you say, Chris, you write about what you know, so you write about Catholicism. This is a play about a sex addict. Uh, is there uh, oh, any... Uh, I've walked into a trap. <laughs> That's Where's right. I've been waiting to swing this one <laughs> on you. Uh, any uh, Chris Durang here in Sex and Longing? Were you ever a sex addict? Someone would have sex 15 minutes like Lulu, Chris? You can tell, Shelley. Well, your certainly friends. not every 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, I know something about sexual addiction, both from friends and... Uh, I don't know. We, we'll have to wait. I'm late in my life. I'm going to write a very racy biography, and if anyone's still interested, Ooh. you can all read it then. How, how late? <laughs> Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, right. you know, some of it is just. Uh, well, you're a child of your times. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Well, <laughs> you're making me seem old. <laughs> <laughs> you're a young fogey, right? But let's get back to it a little bit. I mean, you have some experience with sexual addiction. I, I don't want you to, addiction. I want you to tell us everything that's going to be in your biography. But I mean, did you go through a period <laughs> in your life where? Uh, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, sort of, I guess. Sort of. Like the Justin character, the the, the uh, gay character who's out. Hang on the street corners looking for Well, people. not exactly street corners. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in the past, and I'm alive. Yeah, so. hell, and are you a sex addict? Oh, you? wow. <laughs> well, no, that's why I understand Bridget so well. <laughs> I, of course, do not approve of sex uh, in any form whatsoever <laughs> with any living creature. <clears throat> Don't get me started. It's Halloween. <laughs> now, <laughs> necrophilia is another thing. Is the, are you getting an audience that is offended by the content of the play, or are you getting an audience that you're preaching to the converted, that they all agree they're religious, right, the Christian writer, a bunch of lunatics and nuts, and we should make fun of them? Well, not the latter, because it is more of a mix than that. D don't you agree? I think there is a kind of a, yes, there is a mix, and, um, and, and there are certain... I mean, some nights we wonder, is, the, is New York just filled with Democrats? Because yeah. there is one line uh, late in the play that gets a big laugh and applause that has to do with being a Republican. Right. Right. And yet, uh, you've acknowledged that you're a Republican. I was and, the only person who wasn't and, laughing that night. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and this is airing after the election. You'll be the only person who voted for Bob Dole. And I got at least <laughs> one, one letter from a Republican woman who said uh, she, she enjoyed the play. So I have to show you that letter. I don't know if I did. Oh, but she liked it. She oh, liked yeah. it. It was very, I thought, uh, open-minded of her. Um, but so I don't know. But I don't know about preaching to the converted. Plus, I mean, I don't quite know what the solution to preaching to the converted is. To you know, what go to the Republican convention and say, guess what? Sit down. I'm going to put on we a play. Skit, right. and that <laughs> we really see work. when we're standing doing the curtain calls. We see people who are wildly enthusiastic. But we can also see people who are sitting there, kind of applauding and perfunctorily and looking confused or dazed or angry or you know. I, do I think mean, that people who've sat through the whole thing but are still not sure whether they're glad they did or not. You right. know. I, I, I do think that not only whatever religious right buttons might get push, pushed, I do think some people just don't respond to my humor. And mm -hmm. that, that's hard for me because every so often, you know, I'll, say, I'll be standing in the back of the house and the audience will be laughing away and I'll just focus on the, on the one person who's <laughs> just hating it. And, you know, I can't go up and say, you're objectively wrong. You should, you know, because I've sometimes gone to plays where the audience laughs their and head off, and it, it, it doesn't touch it. my uh, humor button. Yeah. So humor is a mysterious thing, and it, it does vary. And, and if you've never liked a play by me, chances are you won't like this one. But if you have liked them sometimes, I think you may. Mm -hmm. And that time is up. <laughs> oh, it flies by. Day, it flies the play by is Sex and Longing. Now go see and judge for yourself. Don't be swayed by the New York Times like all the other lemmings in this town. Chris Durang, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Dave, Dana Ivey giving a terrific performance. Thank you very much. Thank a you. wonderful pleasure. Okay. Thanks. Stay tuned for the Broadway update. Look at this terrible book I found in a store the other day. Explicit photographs of the last 300 people we slept with by Justin Stewart and Lulu Dubois with an introduction by Camille Paglia. <laughs> we must force people to aspire to higher things. This book is mostly close-ups of people's genitals. I know, it's my worst fantasy. <laughs> I recognize this woman's face. Please don't show it to me. I may get sick. Her name is Sadie Thompson, but she has recently changed it to Lulu. You know her? In my ministry, I often come across people in the lowest rings of debauchery. I tried to save her before. Maybe, with your husband's help, we can turn her into an example, an example the entire country can learn from. Yes! Now you're cooking and pass 
laws, lots of laws. For big sex education, let the parents choose the school books. Let me choose them. Put prayer back in school. No birth control, no condoms, no sex outside marriage, no homo... Sexuality, yes, yes, all of that. Yes, thank God I can't stand living now. I have to change it. That's the kind of person I am. Yes, Michael, what's happening with this Les Mis thing? Les Miserables, yes, they're calling mm -hmm. it the Les Miserables mac uh, Massacre. Cameron McIntosh, the producer of Les Miserables, has um, uh, fired most of the cast of Les Miserables, which is going into its 10th year. Uh, his reasoning is that it is time to rethink the production for the special 10th anniversary. They want to recast it completely. A few of the actors, about nine from this company, will be held over, but everyone else, a few of them will have to audition for their roles or they will be finding what a find humiliation. New, new people. <laughs> right. Well, uh, To audition for your role? Well, oh, yes, yeah, but you yeah, know, yeah. The, the thing though, Susan, is that Broadway is not the British civil service. No one guarantees you a <laughs> lifetime job on Broadway. And any actor who thinks that he should is entitled to stay in a role for 10 years it's crazy. He should have become he should have become uh, a postman a CPA, or he should have right. become an accountant. The problem is though that <clears throat> Actors Equity has this contract. It's called a pink contract uh -huh. that says and this is the madness of Broadway, the madness of unions on Broadway that says you cannot fire a chorus person unless you give that person seventeen thousand five hundred dollars severance pay. Now that's a pretty big chunk of change for 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 productions that run on a tight margin of error. McIntosh, to his credit, abided by that contract, is giving the people not only seventeen thousand five hundred dollars but an additional ten thousand dollars. So each of them is walking away with twenty seven thousand dollars. Plus, many of them have been with that show for ten years. Now they're whining and they're complaining that they have mortgages to pay. Well, you know, so do I. And guess what? My job at the Daily News is not a lifetime guarantee either. Can they fire That's you on a dime? Because uh, you're getting too old and they don't like the way you look. <laughs> <laughs> but why, if you are getting too old for it, the, the, the people I wanted to get rid of were, were these guys in the chorus who are playing student revolutionaries. They were cast when they were like 21, 22. Now they're 32, 33, 30, some of them are 37. Whoa, okay. They put on a little bit of weight. Uh, I mean, you have to be true to the production and the production values. And you cannot run a business on Broadway where you tell the producer, the unions tell the producer, you can't fire this person. You can't get rid of that person. So what's their They're trying to keep the show in the best possible shape it can deal? be in. And to do that, they have got to have the right to let people go when their time is up. So how is Equity reacting to this? Well, Equity uh, um, has said publicly that they're uh, um, uh, upset about it, that they see it as a uh, maybe a watershed event, which will allow other producers of these long-running shows like Phantom of the Opera and Miss Saigon, the Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh shows, to, to let house. all of these other <laughs> people go. But the fact of the matter is, Cameron uh, McIntosh abided by the equity contract, so they can't and there's nothing that they can do But about now it. that they've done this, and it's sort of created kind of bad blood in terms of publicity. I suppose you could say that it was not handled as well. Right, so I mean, let me what finish. they should have done, they should have fired them all quietly one by one. Right. No one would have written so, about it. So then how are they going to attract this upscale cast that they're thinking of to bring it back <laughs> Oh, really? over you, the you, Susan, you honestly believe there are actors out there, if Cameron McIntosh offers them a role in the new company of uh, Les Miserables, they're going to stand on principle and not accept the job because somebody they knew was fired before? You know, you know how competitive actors are. They just assume stab you in the back as they would take you out to dinner. <laughs> oh, what, what an indictment of, of many people in our audience. I hope that you're not offended. So Broadway's a brutal place. Grow of, up, kids. Speaking of the brutality of Broadway, um, how about Rent? Well, yeah, this is interesting, too. Um, the contract negotiations for the um, uh, kids in rent just have begun. Uh, their contracts are up uh, in, in a month or so. <clears throat> and uh, there was a little attempt to be like the cast of Friends, where these kids in rent thought, if we band together, we can get high-flying salaries. Now, what they wanted, people like Adam Pascal, Daphne Rubin Vega, they wanted $10,000 a week. Now, give me a break. Whoa. Who is the star of rent? Rent is the star of rent. rent. There are a million Daphne Rubin Vegas out there. There are a million Adam Pascals out there. They're terrific performers. They do they give a, a, a they do a great job in the show, but they are not so essential to the show that it cannot run without them. This point was made to them by the producers of the show, and immediately their little friends band disbanded, and they came back, and now uh, they've all signed on. They they're, they're going to stay with the show, and they're not getting ten thousand a week. Okay, I think okay. that the, the top ones are getting. 5000 a week, and then it goes from there. Now, that said, uh, you know, again, the producers are always made out to be the heavies here, but the producers of Rent have done a lot for these kids. A year ago, Daphne Rubin Vega, Idina Menzel, and Adam Pascal were singing at bar mitzvahs in New Jersey. Making $50 and now dollars on, a week, yeah. And now they're on Broadway and they want $10,000. And, you know, if you week. walk by a casting call for Rent, and they've, they've had a few down at Musical Theater Works, the line is around the block three times over. They've cast, uh, they've cast the Boston Company. They're in the process mm -hmm. of casting uh, two road companies. They're casting a London 
company. The producers will tell you privately that there are plenty of young, talented kids out there who can be put in that part. One other thing that the producers did for these kids is, you know, they gave the, uh, the whole cast one percentage of the gross for, the lifetime, for their lifetimes. Well, no kidding. When did that happen? Uh, when, the, when the show first started. Really? Why did they do What a good, deal. Good faith, because they said, <laughs> you, kid, you guys were with this show from the very beginning, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to show you that we appreciate that when you worked for so little down off And Broadway, they work very hard. We're going to give you one percent of the gross. Right. Now, okay, it's not a whole hell of a lot of money, but over time, since rent uh, estimate, uh, is estimated by the Wall Street Journal probably to make $800 million to a billion dollars, that'll fixed be for a life. nice... It'll be a nice uh, 401k plan, so to speak, for them. It's much the thing, same thing, by the way, that the producers of A Chorus Line did for the original cast of A Chorus Line. They, oh. own a, they all own a very tiny percentage of the show, but they keep getting but they money wrote that every show. week. The Chorus Line people helped write that show. Well, That's yes. a little different. Well, do, uh, you know, did they write it? I mean, writers steal from everybody. You always have no, to pay no, a writer no, if he's no, going to no. pick up your life story because it sounds interesting to him. And very chorus line was built out of improvs by those people. Yeah, so but it was built by thing. Michael Bennett. It was not built by the chorus well, kids, and they got exactly what they should have got, which was a small percentage of the gross. Right. So I which think is what the rent kids get. They're getting incredible. Baby. So, so we both agree. So the rent kids get to keep their jobs, and the lay Miz kids are out on the street. <laughs> It's a brutal business. Yeah, but you know what? I, I really, I really do have to defend the producers here. They are running a, they are running a business, and I think with these shows that have run ten years, people got a little too comfortable into thinking that, hey, I'm set for life. I never have to leave it. And Cameron McIntosh and the producer John Caird, and, uh, I'm sorry, the director John Caird, they want to rethink Les Miserables for the 21st century. So and stay I tuned. I think that they have every right to do it because they pay the bills. Michael, good night. Oh, show business, I love it. <laughs> See you next time on Theater Talk.